So hello everyone that has joined us. Um, thank you so much for joining us this beautiful Sunday afternoon. Um, as you may know, this is our 50th episode and we're so grateful for all the conversations that have happened over the year. And we've had such amazing guests. And we also thank you all for your continuous support. So before we begin, just a couple things. Um, this episode will be recorded and available for you to rewatch and share. Um, if you want to stay updated with, uh, um, you know, with us, just go to layersofdesign.online. If you have any questions for our guests today, please, you can leave them in the chat box and we will be sure to get to them at the end of the session. And once you're done with your sketches, would we'll love to see them on Instagram. So you can tag us at layers of design underscore and use the hashtag layers of sketches. You could also connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. And most of all, you can listen to all of our episodes, including this one on Spotify podcast, Google podcast, and almost pretty much any um, streaming platform. So as you know, and for those that might be joining us for the first time, Sketch It Out is a new series hosted by Layers of Design that we started this year. And this is where we invite a special guest to, you know, have a conversation with a topic of um, that we decide on prior. And we also get to sketch a building of our choice. So just right before I introduce our guest, this is our 50th episode, as we said, and I'm very excited to announce that our sponsor for this episode is actually Morfolio Trace. And if you don't know, Morfolio Trace is a tracing app where you can sketch out ideas quickly. You could create floor plans, renderings, and really just be a designer. Um, so today, our producer, Gabriel Diaz, will actually be using this app to sketch out um, our building during the episode, and we'll be sharing that with you later on today. So <laughs> today, I have the pleasure of introducing our final guest of the year, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg. She's an architect, urban planner, and a founding partner at DPZ Partners. Um, well, I actually first met Elizabeth about a month ago through the AIA Christopher Kelly Leadership Program. And learning about her and her accomplishments, I just knew I had to have her as a guest. <laughs> a few days after that, I actually sent out an email to her. And a few days after, we were on a Zoom call discussing my goals and my career. And I must say that she gave me a push that I really needed. Um, just to help me realize where to begin in the path that I am working towards. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, for connecting with me and honestly being a part of Layers of Design. Welcome. Well, thank you, Abehi. This is a wonderful opportunity for me too. I remember that conversation, enjoyed it tremendously and um, look forward to today's conversations. Yes, perfect. So before we get <laughs> into our topic of discussion, um, I would like to ask you, what got you into architecture and design? Uh, it's a, a short and a long answer. Uh, my father was an architect. That's the short part. <laughs> um, so, you know, I saw his work. I saw the drawings uh, that he was doing. Um, there was always some construction going on at our house, um, uh, which is really a great experience for a, a, a small child. Um, and so that um, set me off on the path to seek an, an education in architecture. Um, that was a longer path, uh, as uh, many of you know. Uh, and um, uh, uh, But I made it through that. I have an architect's degree. I have an architect's license, um, MCARB. Um, I tell anybody who wants to listen to me, I think the license is really important. It's what makes you autonomous um, and lets you make decisions about your own career as a professional. Um, and uh, it has served me well. Um, so uh, after that, the longer story. Anyway, um, but you know, I, I do understand that uh, because I was exposed to it um, early, it was easier for me in a way to enter the profession at a time when there were no um, essentially no women, um, then 
now as we look at um, the people who are not represented enough in the profession, how do we help them get in uh, when they're not exposed to it as children uh, is a challenge. Definitely. And that's something I noticed that there's a huge push from professionals and different organizations to, to expose more children to the profession of architecture. Yeah. Um, so can you actually tell us about your first job in the profession? Um, well, uh, that also was a lucky stroke. Um, my first job was to design a house for my brother. Um, older brother who is 10 years older than I am. So he was just getting ready to um, build something. And um, I was lucky to be able to do that within a couple of years of getting out of school. Um, so uh, that was a great learning experience. At the same time, I was beginning to work with um, uh, my now husband and partner, Andres Duani, and we did some preservation drawings for the oldest house in Key West. Uh, more or less at the same time. Um, and so that opened the door to that aspect of architecture, both preservation and urban design. Oh, nice. So how did you find your niche in the profession? Or would you say you even have a niche per se? Well, I think um, we're currently, um, and for many years, we've probably been known um, uh, primarily as urban designers, although uh, we're still designing and um, working on buildings to be built, individual buildings. Uh, and I would say that that evolved in a way that um, I never planned or anticipated. Um, so that's good news for those of you who are um, uh, wondering what the next few years are going to be like for you. Um, so, uh, you know, the opportunities that came my way, the context of the profession and the culture at the time uh, were all part of that um, direction or, or guidance um, for the direction that my practice took. Oh, wow, that's nice. So can you tell us more about, because I, I, I really want to know more about new urbanism, actually. So can you tell us about that? Sure, and I'll segue out of the last uh, question and answer. Um, so coming to South Florida during the, um, recession, the oil recession of the 70s, 1970s that is. Um, uh, we, I had grown up in Pennsylvania, been to, uh, been to school in the north and um, the South Florida suburban um, development was uh, quite amazing for us. We didn't really understand it very well. We tried to get to know it and we began to understand that there were flaws in the kind of endless extension of um, um, suburban sprawl. Mm. And so while we were working as architects, um, uh, we were also developing a kind of, uh, trying to understand it, developing a critique of it and wondering about alternatives. Uh, and that led to a project in Boca called Charleston Place um, which was a series of townhouses in a suburban subdivision, but designed in a way that no one really expected at the time. Um, it wasn't the kind of garden apartment complex in the middle of parking lots that the code was predicting. Uh, and Seaside followed the opportunity to design Seaside with Robert Davis, the developer, followed shortly thereafter. Um, uh, along the way, I think we... Um, discovered that there were others who were thinking about things in similar ways um, in other parts of the country. Some of them were our colleagues from school. We were still networking with old friends. Uh, and um, as our various practices evolved with these kinds of work, trying to provide alternatives for suburban sprawl, um, we realized that um, we could be very, that those alternatives were needed and um, following the critiques of sprawl, uh, I won't get into that now, and that we would, we really needed to be more powerful and could be more powerful as a group uh, rather than as individuals. So, uh, you know, at work on our own practices. So we started the Congress for the New Urbanism um, back in the 90s, 1990 two, I think, or three, um, which continues to this day as a, 
as a kind of clearinghouse and networking group for um, people who are seeking alternatives or solutions to problems in the built environment. Oh, nice. So before I, I have some more questions in, in particular about that, but I also want us to get started with the sketching. So um, this is the image that I have for us to sketch. So we could all start sketching as we keep going with the conversation. Um, do you have any tricks for us <laughs> in sketching the Biltmore Hotel? Well, um, you know, um, I don't know about tricks for sketching, um, but I do, I could tell you some things that I admire about this building. Um, you know, I think that in terms of sketching, this photo, you've selected a different photo than um, the one I sent you. So I'm getting to know the photo looking at it. <laughs> okay. um, but, you know, this photo has a clear horizon line. Um, if you, um, if you're sketching uh, either objects or spaces between objects. That's what urban design is concerned with, is the spaces between objects. Um, in both cases, understanding where the horizon line to begin with is important. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the vanishing lines. So in this case, should I draw over this? Oh, that? you can. Um, I don't see the ability to annotate. Maybe not. Let me see, because I'm able to annotate. Maybe if you give me control. Can yeah. You in control? Yes, I can. Uh, you see, I, this is, I have to start drawing right away because that's what I do with my students <laughs> when they put up their work. Did that work? No, it didn't. <laughs> okay. well, let's go back to the photograph then. Okay. And I'll just point out, maybe you can move your cursor along it as I give you a few words. Um, so, you know, that photograph in particular uh, might be, might make sketching pretty easy because um, the top of that colonnade um, with all the columns that runs through much of the half of the photograph at the just above the pool. Okay, uh, sorry, can you actually try annotating right now? I think I was able to figure it out. Yeah, yes, thank you. Perfect. All right, so, um, you know, this, it's hard to do with a trackpad. I don't have a, um, a mouse, but this is practically speaking the, almost the horizon, right? Mm -hmm. And there it is right in the photograph. Um, uh, and, you know, there might be, there's clearly another one that's, uh, I mean, and then there are the vanishing points that are being set up. Um, this is a great building to, to be able to see that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, that might help you in uh, kind of establishing what it is that you're working on, and then you might work off that um, the, the photographer very kindly uh, straightened all the verticals. You know, usually you see some keystoning, but it looks like we're doing pretty well on um, that the verticals are straight, so you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and um, there's also the wonderful thing that there's some palms in the foreground, the palm shadows. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. So, um, of course, there's a different vanishing for this building. So probably one of the keys is to kind of set up where all of these places are. Uh, you know, the kind of key points, mm -hmm. vertical points that from which, um, you know, presumably the same things would be. You know, it would be going in the same direction towards those vanishing points. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but <laughs> you know, um, this, uh, I suggested this building for you because um, uh, this is a more complex side of it, but when you 
look at the front of it, you'll notice that it's really a kind of a big box with a tiny little tower on top. Uh, and our perception of it is that it's a tower building with wings. Um, and the, here we are seeing it, um, uh, we are focusing in a sense more on the wings. But it's also, um, one of the other things you might note is that many, um, many aspects of it are designed according to a proportion of the double square. I'm drawing the arch in the, at the pool house here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's a double, I'm pretty sure that's a double square. Um, and uh, you, and so you can be thinking about these, you know, when you start looking at kind of these, the relief of those arches, they're probably double squares also. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know if these, don't know about the windows over on the left. Um, so that's one um, aspect, and actually many of the historic buildings in Coral Gables, that, by the way, Ramon Trias, the city planning director taught me this. The uh, city of Coral Gables has a wonderful guidebook for the architect's board, which is made up of photographs and, and also largely drawings from the historic period of its early buildings, where you can begin to see all this thing, all these kind of um, rules or a kind of proportional harmony um, drawn out uh, quite explicitly. Um, but other things you'll notice is that the wings usually tend to stress their horizontality. So um, I think I can, I'm going to erase this and just talk about something different for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, notice that the horizontal pieces have very strongly delineated horizontal lines, you know, several of them to make them and what that does is it helps the building appear to be longer, wider, you know, longer in its width, in its length. Um, and you'll notice that there's very little verticality, um, vertical um, reinforcement beyond the fact that the windows line up. Um, uh, and then, but the tower, even though it does have these uh, horizontal bands, has a lot of, uh, emphasis on the vertical components, the double windows lining up, even these pin, these things, these um, the little pinnacles, they have a name, I've forgotten what they're called, you know, are pointing up. Uh, and so everything about the building is, about the tower is pointing up and everything about the wings is pushing out or, uh, and so there's this, uh, if you were to just draw the outline of the building, you might be surprised how kind of big and bulky it is compared and how little the tower seems sitting on top of it. Um, but that tower at the front of the building is expressed all the way down to the first floor. You know, it's extruded. We can't see that here. So anyway, um, just a few things that might help you with your drawings. Wow, thank you for pointing those out. Um, so that was, that was like a nice history lesson. <laughs> so it's back to the Congress for New Urbanism. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know it's focused on human skilled urban design. Can you um, explain more what human skill urban design is? So, um, you know, the emphasis is on making uh, places that are walkable. Um, for one, so there is an there's an issue of that's a that's an issue of dimensions, um, and then as well that there be some kind of sense of place or identity um, in which the uniqueness of a place can be expressed or understood or enjoyed. So, what are those two things? Um, uh, and so, if you think of a place, you know. Um, and, and essentially what the new urbanism deals with is the making of space, of making urban space and defining it in, in a way that um, 
helps to make people feel safe, comfortable, and interested in being there. Um, so one of our best local ones, and this was carried out or borne out in a Miami Herald poll several years ago when um, the Herald asked uh, residents of South Florida to send in their votes for the, their favorite street in town. Um, the one that won was, I wonder if anybody wants to guess what that might have been. But it, what's the most beautiful street in Miami? Should we ask people to yes. submit that on chat before I give it away? <laughs> yes. If you have any idea, please post it in the chat. Um, I'll come back to that and we'll see okay. if it does post something. But um, so streets are our public spaces. And the reason that we're focused on public space um, and urban space is because that's the place, those are the places we share. Um, not only do we all pay for them through our taxes, right? Um, but those are the places where uh, that's not private property. It's the public realm, which should be accessible and inviting and welcome to all of us. Um, and that's um, a very important aspect of being part of a, of, of a society. Um, now, there's been, so how is that different than what we know in suburban development, the development of the last 50 or 70 years? Well, that's been done on a kind of one-on-one, -on -one, one-off um, idea that you just do whatever you want on your property. There are a few rules you have to follow, building codes, zoning codes. Uh, and then the engineers, the public engineers are, you know, are, supposed to make the streets uh, carry as much traffic as possible. Uh, and that's not a formula for placemaking. It's not a formula for safety, beauty, um, uh, or um, it's not particularly interesting. It's the same everywhere. And what we understood um, looking nearby at places like Española Way, in Miami Beach, the old parts of Miami Beach or Key West, was that these were places that had a great sense of place. People wanted to be there. Um, uh, they even seemed to be valuable. Um, and we began to understand the difference between the, the space making. There's a great book out now called Space and Anti-Space. Um, recently published by Steve Peterson and Barbara Littenberg, um, who were urban designers in New York, uh, who were who do a very nice job of pointing out that difference. And the new urbanists were picking up on that same understanding, um, uh, with the understanding that as well, um, because of environmental, so maybe there's a kind of social aspect to that, making the space, shared space of the public realm. But there were also environmental issues. How do you get people out of cars, uh, make, uh, make cities or communities transit friendly and walkability is a big component of that. Mm -hmm. You're gonna walk to transit, so um, it better be a nice walk or you're, not, or you're gonna take your car. Um, and that has to do with dimensions. Um, are the sidewalks wide enough? Um, the Europe, there's some European studies which have pointed out that the streets that people like the best to be in usually have as much sidewalk space as vehicular space, yes. not more. Um, and then the blocks have to be the right length. If the blocks are too long, um, you know, the walk's not convenient because um, you have to go you know, way around the block just to get to the other side. So blocks of a certain dimension. Um, one of our rules of thumb is a block should not be more than a quarter, a quarter of a mile in circumference on an average. And th there's kind of natural understandings of that. If you go down to the uh, downtown Miami, uh, some of those early blocks were um, made smaller by the uh, pedestrian walks that were put through. I think one of them is a jewelry district walk and others go through buildings um, um, to make that 
effective walking distance shorter. So the width of streets, the width of sidewalks, um, the size of the block. We talk about something called the pedestrian shed, uh, which is the five minute walk from center to edge of a neighborhood or a district. Um, it's, a, it, you know, we draw these circles with the, um, let's see if I can, not relevant to, and by the way, I didn't pick a space to draw because it's actually hard um, to photograph a space well. Um, but, you know, if this is, oh, I can't really draw a good circle, but this is a five minute walk, right? From here to there. And within that might be, you know, streets and blocks of, uh, many different dimensions. Now my cursor is not working at all. So at any rate, let me just point out that that, um, that pedestrian shed, uh, you know, that's riffing off the watershed, that the words like that, or the economic shed, uh, that that's important. And you'll find, um, you know, if you put a, if you drop a pin in the, in the intersection in downtown Coconut Grove and you draw the five minute walk, um, you know, most of the commercial part of the Grove is encompassed within that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's a good way of defining a neighborhood um, that might have some kind of cohesion of both um, social cohesion. Um, and then the sense of place is generated by um, not only that kind of network of public spaces, but the vertical proportion, um, which the buildings provide. So uh, when we write codes for uh, urban design, our concern with the building is how it faces the street. What does it contribute to the street? Much less than what it does on the rest of its property um, or what use is in it. Uh, so um, the Biltmore has even out front where there's, it seems like there's only the Biltmore, but if you go there, there's also the church, the congregational church that's across from it. it has a great sense of place. Um, and it, is, it has a lot to do with the building and the way it kind of enfolds you, the, the arms that are leaning towards you, the, those wings. Um, and the way it's designed uh, and the way I described to you, the verticals and the proportions uh, and the horizontals um, uh, is a very important aspect of that sense of place. So, you know, we knew, I think we knew a lot more about that um, or we were willing to wield that knowledge a lot more as architects a hundred years ago uh, than we are now. You know, now it's, I'm afraid it's a little bit of every architect has to have their brand and that's the most important thing to put out there in a building. And we think that everyone wants like the latest thing to mm -hmm. be, um, to appear in the next building. And we, in that way, we lose track of the fact that we really should be trying to make more than the sum of the parts when we put buildings out in the city. Um, we're really making cities and we're making the backdrop for, um, for the lives of, of people. Um, and the public spaces are the most important places for us to be able to interact. And especially these days, you know, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's taught us about how valuable those open spaces are um, and how critical they are to our good health. Definitely. So real quick, in the chat, we have some guesses. Oh, let's look. <laughs> so we have Kaya Ocho, Carl Way, Miracle Mile or Lincoln Road, and Ocean Drive. Did anyone get it? Good guesses. No, I almost gave it away. It was <laughs> Camilla Way. Oh. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you know, the reason that I think it appeared, um, uh, unless, unless there was voter fraud, I don't think there was back then, um, is that it's, it's this, it was the same architect designed both sides of the street. And there is, 
a tremendous amount of attention to the facades of those buildings as they interact with the street. It's also a very narrow street, so it probably has a proportion of close to one to one, one uh, the dimension across from building to building and the uh, dimension to accord it in ratio to the height of the buildings, um, because that ratio of, of street space, one to one or one to three have been long considered um, beautiful or um, appealing, I guess I would say, you know, that, that you feel comfortable in that space. So um, speaking on the Congress of New Urbanism, how can people get involved? Um, and I guess who exactly also can get involved? Um, well, you, uh, you can visit the website of the Congress for the New Urbanism, cnu.org, and look at some of the documents that are there. We, we wrote, um, and we had great ambitions, we wrote a charter of the new urbanism, um, which I think you would find is still highly relevant, um, with 27 points, 27 guidelines. Um, uh, and, um, you know, so you could get to know that. And there's lots of information there about what various uh, initiatives are underway. Um, uh, you know, who, who's doing a little bit of who's doing what. But I would say um, once you get to know that, if that appeals to you um, and working on those kinds of issues, uh, Anytime you design an individual building in any practice, you can certainly attend to how that building confronts the public space. Like, what is it doing for the street space out front? Are there frequent doors and windows? Mm -hmm. um, is there some way that the activity of the build inside the building is allowed to uh, inform the street? Um, will you have eyes on the street? What kind of embellishment will interest people as they walk by it, not just drive by it. Um, one of the big challenges is scale. You know, sometimes we're asked to design very big buildings these days, mm -hmm. make them uh, pedestrian friendly um, in terms of scale. And so even as an working on an individual building, you can be thinking about um, how you are influencing public space or how you might be setting up a pattern that the next building next to you might pick up. Mm -hmm. uh, whether um, it's a rhythm of doors and windows or uh, maybe even an, an arcade to protect people walking along the front of the building or there are lots of things like that. Uh, a roof line that could be continued. Um, and then, of course, you can get involved in an urban design practice. Um, firms like ours or Dover Coal uh, in South Miami or Juan, Juan Mularat's company, Plus Erbia, um, Bernard Ziskovich's firm uh, mm -hmm. does urban design. Um, and of course, getting involved in the public discourse um, and participating in the decision-making um, about our, about the public realm. Uh, one of the big items coming up locally is this idea that we need a, a wall, a high wall to keep out storm surge, which mm. the federal government has suggested that I think everybody locally is absolutely against. Um, and, you know, we're going to need people who are willing to um, talk about that in public. So speaking on the storm surge and actually in disasters in general, um, as an urban planner, what role do you play when a disaster happens in a community? Um, good idea, good question. So of course we've had experience with uh, responding um, in relation to the built environment after going as far back as Hurricane Andrew. Mm -hmm. Uh, and multiple hurricanes since then. We managed a large uh, rebuilding uh, planning process in Mississippi 
um, after Hurricane Katrina, for instance. And architects came up with some very interesting um, proposals, not only that have taken on a life of their own, like the Katrina Cottage, um, which is almost, which is a kind of tiny house that emerged from that, but also pushing um, the agencies to do a better job um, in terms of uh, recovery and rebuilding. So um, there are three stages after a catastrophe like that. Um, um, you know what, I wasn't ready for this question, so I forgot what all three are. There are three R's, but recovery and rebuilding are two of them. Um, I think the first one is about just making sure that everybody's safe. And then um, the second one is giving people uh, temporary housing or someplace to go. Um, and then the third one is going back to the community and um, rebuilding it. And um, uh, so usually, you know, everybody says we're going to rebuild back better. Uh, and, you know, I think that's even a kind of clarion call of the new administ administration coming in, build back better after the troubles we're going through now. Um, and so we, that, that it is an opportunity to help people think about ways to rebuild and improve as long as you're making that huge effort, how do you make it better afterwards? Now, that said, I teach a course on climate change adaptation uh, at the University of Miami. And I think one of the things we've become aware of over the years, um, and as part of that course, is that at some point you need to understand that maybe you shouldn't build back. There's some places where we shouldn't be. Maybe we shouldn't have been there ever. Uh, maybe it's just been exacerbated by rising, um, uh, by increased flooding. Um, rainfalls and so on, uh, but we're going to have to be thinking about how to um, help people leave places. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if you want to get into that topic, but that's one that... Um, yeah, of course, we can definitely get into it. Uh, you know, that it's going to involve other disciplines, certainly, um, mm -hmm. legal and financial, but it's really about getting people out of harm's way. Um, and so um, one of the things that the new urbanists are talking about is um, encouraging the cities that maybe have lagged in economic development in the last decades to reconsider their position vis-a-vis -vis, um, climate. And if they're in a good place to uh, make a point of welcoming climate emigres, uh, you know, someone who's, tired of cleaning the flood up for the third time in, in Houston or Miami. And uh, yes, you can move to high ground nearby. Um, but as I tell my students, if you don't want to continue dealing with these things, maybe you should go somewhere where they're not. There's no flood. Um, as it is in some places, you know, and it's not just flooding, it's fire. It's drought, um, you know, the extreme heat in Arizona that sometimes grounds the airplanes. Um, those are things that we need to be thinking about in terms of where we build. So for, have you done any work internationally through the um, Congress of New Urbanism? Um, uh, yes, we have. Um, there, we have uh, international members, uh, people from uh, all over who come to our meetings. It's interesting having those meetings virtually, which we did last summer. Um, and there are other organizations internationally uh, that are similarly oriented. I can mention some of those. Um, but a number of the new urbanists have worked abroad, and um, including my firm. Uh, we've worked in um, South and Central America. I have a project that I'm working on that's that's starting up, going through approvals in Mexico. In oh, wow. That's exciting. And that's been very, um, very interesting um, to participate in, with people in other countries. Um, the Philippines um, and in Europe, 
Um, certainly some of them have been built, one in Belgium. Um, uh, we've worked with the Prince of Wales on his town called Poundbury in England. Uh, my husband wrote the, the design guidelines for it. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think um, we've done a project almost everywhere. Um, not all of them, uh, of course, get built, but um, uh, many of the things I told you, like the dimensions, the sense mm -hmm. of thing, the walkability, they're, you know, they are universal needs. Um, and so, although the, um, the sense of place, the architecture, maybe the vertical expression uh, has different requirements and should um, have different uh, identifying components depending on where you are and what the culture is. Uh, but certainly some of the principles of good urban design are um, uh, timeless and place and applicable everywhere. Nice. Th these are really good points. I hope everyone is taking notes because <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> um, so what are some of your favorite public spaces, either locally or internationally? Um, so, you know, there are so many, but they, I really admire the spaces that are made intentionally where someone took the risk, was ambitious and took the risk to try to make that space great because you know how do you know it's going to turn out well right <laughs> well maybe once you have experience you're pretty sure but <laughs> um so you know i agreed with the voters on espanola way i think that's a um, absolutely charming and fascinating it's a little bit tarted up now the way it's been painted and it's full of tables and chairs so you can mm -hmm. hardly see it but but it has you know, the initial character and personality of it is great. Um, and there are wonderful spaces um, all over the world. I think I admire tremendously the urban spaces of um, European cities, um, uh, particularly the, the kinds of squares and boulevards. Um, uh, the squares and um, the small spaces that we feel comfortable in, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Piazza Navona in Rome at Christmas when it's full of lights and um, the stands that are set up as a kind of holiday market is a magical place. Um, the the uh, Place Fustenburg in Paris or the Place, um, the Place Vendôme, I'm getting, I, have a, I haven't been in these places for a while so but there's one uh, plaza in Paris that has the same kind of design on all four sides. It's rather large and it has an arcade at the ground level and it has uh, trees that reiterate its shape inside in the green park and uh, streets on all four sides. Um, and, uh, you know, 18th century beautiful buildings all around it. Uh, that was a development that was a real estate development in which the developer um, built all the walls of the space without the buildings behind them. And then he sold off the lots and people built their buildings onto his walls. You know, it's a kind of stage set. Um, so the, the quality of the space and therefore the value of everybody's investment was guaranteed by the fact that um, it was there and beautiful to begin with. Um, an interesting approach. Um, so it's places like that, but then there are the large open spaces that uh, can be quite wonderful too. Uh, someone just sent me a photograph of um, the, where the photograph was split down the middle with Central Park on the right and um, the east side on the left it was an aerial photo. And you realize what a great urban place that is, mm -hmm. Central Park with, you know, if you've ever walked down either the west side or east side of the park and looked at all the buildings. Um, I always walk around looking up and down, <laughs> which 
it's very easy to bump into people because you're looking at the buildings. <laughs> but it's exciting. That's why I really enjoy doing that as well, just like observing the environment. Um, one of my favorite spaces or areas, I guess, in neighborhoods in Miami recently is actually the, the design district. And um, just walking around there, I've, I'm always just, I guess, in awe of how, is, I feel like they took no, they made no compromises almost <laughs> with the design of, of the neighborhood. So I, am, I really enjoy walking around the design district. Um, well, it, it's, kind, it's nice that you said that because I helped um, bring that into being. Um, oh, wow. I worked how with Craig Robbins on the plan for it. And um, part of the plan was that there were two important things. One was that the buildings would be individual buildings instead of long mm. new buildings. There's a lot of new building there and it looks like there's many older older new buildings or, um, you know, they're individual buildings. Mm -hmm. and fortunately, those ideas coincided with um, the, idea that the brands had of wanting to develop, have their own buildings designed individually. So that kind of increment, which is a pedestrian scale increment, you know, we were talking about what is it that makes buildings interesting to pedestrians. Mm -hmm. So that kind of changing personality as you walk by it um, is important. Um, and then the other thing that break in the blocks, you know, because um, the blocks are like 600 or 800 feet long, which is too long for pedestrian comfort. So that pedestrian walkway through uh, is important to the fact that you can wander around um, and, yes. you know, turn left or right and come back this way or that way. And um, that's very important for pedestrian interest, but also for, um, for the shops. The way people, Definitely. the way people window shop, or um, so yeah, and and Craig Robbins is a is a a very someone who um, loves architecture, loves um, art, and always asks for everybody's best performance. So um, I think there are some nice things going on there because of him. Yes, it's, it's a really beautiful neighborhood. <laughs> oh, and I, um, I meant to add, I'm sorry, I meant to add, I didn't just mean to point to myself, um, Terry Riley, the architect, uh, also helped curate the choice of architects. And, oh. uh, and so there, was, there are guiding hands that make places like that. So, so the I guess can, can I ask what are some of the standards that have put in that have been put in place for any new architect or you know anyone that finds like a plot of land in the area? Um, well, uh, the design district is a special area within the um, city's zoning code. There's some there's a category called special area plan, and it has a geographic limit. So, um, but the zoning code that's that it sits within Miami 21, uh, which is also uh, somewhat my responsibility. I was one of the consultants working on it, um, really speaks to this intent of pedestrian, making a pedestrian friendly city. Mm -hmm. And that involves how the buildings meet the sidewalk. So it, it does not allow parking to be, you know, to be the parking lot or the parking garage to be what you walk by. That has to be behind a building that's habitable. Um, it, it asks for frequent doors and windows so you don't have blank walls. And so you have that kind of variety and the street being monitored and the idea that people will come, be coming and going along the street. Um, it, it also has a kind of um, limit to the height of the street wall before buildings have to set back so you don't have a kind of sheer wall mm -hmm. of 40 stories that's right next to you. Uh, and a few other things like that. So um, the design district fits into that, those broad parameters. Uh, but I would say, as you can see when you're there, that each, the, the kind of quality of architecture of each building is um, really quite unique. 
Yes, it is. Um, so what are some skills that have been valuable throughout your career? Um, well, I'm listening and drawing. <laughs> uh, the, you know, I grew up drawing thanks to my father and uh, uh, parents who understood very quickly that if you put a pencil in a child's hand, um, they are no longer bored. Uh, and maybe they're quieter as a result too. <laughs> um, but I think being able to draw what I'm thinking about or to draw through ideas has always been very important. I think drawing, uh, and I even, when I take notes, I think it's more like drawing than taking notes. Um, Michael Graves, um, the famous architect of our time who no longer is alive, um, wrote, but it wrote a beautiful article, I think in the 1980s, it's worth looking up because it's still relevant. Um, and he said, there are three reasons to draw. One is um, to record something that you're seeing. Uh, so you're doing that right now, those of you who are sketching. And I dare say, as you're drawing, you're learning something about that building. Um, if you took that photograph, you you know, you maybe you set it up for a few minutes, um, you snap the photo and then it's done and you've stopped thinking about it. But when you're drawing it to record it, you have to think about, oh yeah, this is a double square. And look at that, that's really three times as long as this other piece. And look at all the horizontals and look at all the verticals and what are they doing for it? Um, so that's, it's not only recording, but you're learning by that recording. That's why sketchbooks, carrying around a sketchbook is a great idea. Um, the second thing was to present your ideas. You know, you have to present them to the, um, to your client or your teacher or to whomever needs to see them. Um, and you can do that by hand, but nowadays we can also do that by, on the computer. Um, I don't know about sketching on the computer. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, the sketching on the, they have a lot of apps that you can sketch on the tablets with. On the iPad, um, yeah. That's yeah, cool. it, it's nice, but it's different. It's definitely different from <laughs> the pen and paper. Yeah, and, then, and but there's a third, there's a third reason to draw. And, and I think this is drawing by hand, definitely, which is that you develop ideas. Um, drawing and your the drawing is a thought process um, and I'm not sure I know you have to think to be drawing on screen you know to be doing AutoCAD or whatever or SketchUp um, but the quickness of the eye hand brain connection and the fact that you can you know pour through ideas very quickly um, as a thought process is is really important. Um, I know that when I start designing something, I have a lot of trashy ideas I have to get rid of right at the beginning. And I can only get rid of them by drawing them. You know, otherwise they're gonna come out, they're gonna keep coming out. And eventually it's kind of backing into the good ideas by discarding the bad ones. Um, and um, drawing as a process of thinking, you know, it's no surprise that now there's this phrase called design thinking, this process called design thinking. Um, that's really what drawing is. Nice. So before I open up the floor to questions, if you have any questions, please don't forget to put it in the chat box. I would like to ask you one last question, Elizabeth. And that is what are two books you would recommend to designers and architects? that are passionate about designing with their environment in mind? You know, I was just distracted because I looked at the chat and Marisa Cortright said the Place de Vosges. And yes, that's exactly what I meant, Marisa. Thank you. <laughs> um, were you asking me for two book titles? Yes. For designers. Yes, that are passionate um, about designing with their environment in mind. Well, um, you know, two 
that I might mention are um, this new one I mentioned. I'm going to go get it. Okay. Here we go. Um, so this one, space and, you know, I always you have to do the reverse to, for the camera to see you, right? <laughs> and anti-space, Barbara uh, is full of, you can see how many marks I put in it, um, of ways of thinking about, I'm even gonna show you one, um, if I can find it right here. Uh, they do a very interesting comparison of Palladio and Le Corbusier, for instance. Um, and of course, the, uh, the way you think about cities in terms of volumes and full of fabulous drawings. This is so hard to do on this kind of camera. I won't do it very long. Anyway, uh, you know, they have a lifetime of beautiful line drawings. They really lend themselves to um, um, whether it's hand or hand drawings or computer drawings, you know, there's really, um, and lots of ideas about what makes, including reference to Colin Rowe, who was one of the um, great teachers of our time, uh, who taught us these kinds of ideas about space, enclosed space open space. And then there's the book, Leon Creer's kind of uh, compendium. I have to do that, I have to do this and then go up, okay. Uh, called The Architecture of Community. Uh, and um, this is made of lots of beautiful drawings too, but it's also made of these kinds of diagrams, do this and not that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you get, I think when you're done, you get a kind of sense of um, uh, a kind of value system about you know, what works and what doesn't. Um, now, Leon's, Leon has a great um, a commitment to traditional architecture um, and traditional um, urban space. Uh, Littenberg and Peterson, I think, are more Catholic in a sense. They have an admiration for contemporary and modern de design as well. Um, uh, but in the end, it all comes down to that kind of space, intentional space making. In other words, it's not um, what's left after you've designed the building. It's what you intend the buildings to make. Um, and there, you might think of them as two very different approaches to get to the same end. Okay, so, thank you so much. Um, I see that we have a- I would be, I have lots of these because oh. we just happen to, I'd be happy to mail one to somebody if they want to. Oh yes, please. <laughs> if they want to tell me, uh, tell me where to send it. <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, so we have a few questions, actually. So the first one is from Santasha Hart, and she's asking, how does urban design interact with the affordable housing crisis? Um, very good question. Um, let me think for a minute if there's a, a quick, if I can make this answer more quickly. <laughs> really is. You know, um, urban design is very important for affordable housing. Uh, it's either, so there's two kinds of affordable housing, right? There's the kind that you might be able to um, make by allowing, uh, without a lot of big funding, by allowing people to have accessory dwelling units um, in their backyard, you know, the garage apartment where someone can live inexpensively or less expensively than in the house in front, right? Although it can help the person in front pay for the mortgage, right? <laughs> um, and then there's the affordable housing that's a big funding project, uh, you know, and related or Gorman or somebody like that produces it, right? 
Um, and very often in those big ones, the kind of uh, repeat patterns of building apartment buildings take precedence over how does that apartment building interact with the city around it. Um, and so I think that um, there's a very important interaction of making affordable housing be part of the community of the city, whether it's the little guy in the backyard or the big apartment building that's facing a street. Um, it should act like anything else. It's, in a, it's, a, it's a building in the city. It has people in it. They have front doors. Um, they need to use the sidewalk. Um, windows and doors facing the sidewalk. And instead of designing it as if it was some kind of special project. And it shouldn't look like affordable housing. I mean, one of the things that we've done in our projects, um, even if the buildings are being funded uh, or subsidized, you can't tell them apart from the market rate buildings. Uh, and that's, that's a kind of tenet of urban design that I think can really be applied to affordable housing. Now, can we make something more affordable? That's probably really what your question was about. <laughs> um, no, but the, the other tools of policy that we um, can promote through zoning codes um, uh, can help. Uh, that said, I would be very careful about one thing. There's a, there's a, a very popular statement these days that there's not enough supply. And if you increase the demand, you will have more affordability, right? Especially developers like to tell you that because they just want you to open up more density or more land for development, right? Because they can get in there right away and buy it at the price that it is today and put more units on it. Um, but eventually, very quickly, that land value will rise to the new density um, and it's no longer going to be affordable. Um, so the, the policy, the finance and policy issues of affordable housing are what we really need to be attending to because there's, those silver bullets are not going to do it. Um, and you no, know, it, it really does require big policy commitment. We're having very interesting discussions right now among the um, in the Congress for the New Urbanism, hoping to, with the intention of producing suggestions for the new head of HUD um, about how the federal government can play a role. Um, but there are local government issues as well. Um, and I don't know, I could keep, this is a course, I can't, shouldn't keep going on this topic because it's <laughs> Very interesting to me, very challenging, uh, and we need new approaches that um, the kind of silver bullets of saying one thing, increase the density, do include, maybe inclusive zoning can help, but it's very hard to apply that. It's very hard to get that done. So, so <laughs> a longer conversation offline. Yes, definitely. Um, so what are your thoughts on Winwood? And what is successful about the area and what could be improved? Um, well, you know, I think Wynwood is, has become a very interesting place precisely because it was so varied. Um, well, you know, we talk about balancing diversity and harmony in urban design. It's kind of like people, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, and you have that in Wynwood. And I think the, the harmony was the fact that there were street walls there already, right? All the, those old warehouses were right up to the sidewalks. And the diversity was that there were narrow streets and wide streets. Um, and some, every once in a while there was an open space that was a parking lot. Um, and, and now the buildings are adding to that diversity. So, um, in a sense, the fact that it started out in a very ad hoc way of, um, you know, the industrial uses were still there. Tony Goldman put in the first two restaurants. He allowed people, you know, that what was graffiti was turned into artwork uh, on the walls. Um, it has had a very 
interesting evolution, which by the way, has influenced many other areas in the world as a way of regenerating um, a piece of city. Um, so now what it has a new, a new code, you know, now it has controls, plus Erbia has produced a kind of new plan and um, enriched the guidelines of Miami 21 for it. Um, but I dare say it's gonna be an interesting place for a while because it will continue to have the kind of mix and variety of uses um, that you see emerging there. What it does need is uh, some of the blocks are very long uh, and they do need to do some cross block walkways um, to maintain, make sure that it, uh, as it develops, that it develops in a pedestrian friendly way. So we have two more questions. Um, the first one is what type of public spaces are best suited for a tropical environment like Miami? Uh, well, you know, I think um, spaces that enable pedestrians to move around with protection from rain and sun. Uh, so certainly arcaded spaces um, work well. Um, not many people want to give up private property for those arcades. Um, and the public Public Works doesn't like to have arcades in their space. There's a lot of other things out there, pipes and wires underground and so on. Um, and so I think one of the, um, one way to uh, deal with that, you know, that we can't have arcades everywhere. We're not Bologna, um, is that you make the streets as narrow as possible so there can be shade uh, or wide enough certainly for trees to be in the street, but not so wide um, that you feel unsafe on them. So tree-lined streets, um, and then every once in a while a courtyard or a garden, um, uh, someplace that where you can add greenery, um, maybe add a porch for protection from the rain. You know, the design district does a certain amount of that. Um, most of the time you're out you're outside of a building envelope, there's no arcade, but every once in a while there's a kind of um, walkway or roofed area that you can retreat to if you need to. And um, the shadows change all day long because the spaces are fairly intimate. So I think that's a, the urban, uh, the, the design district has some good, um, good urban spaces for, what did you say, Tropi the tropical environment. tropical environment. And then the last question, is there a way for more modern buildings to connect more with the public and their surroundings? Well, uh, in speaking of the design district, I think those buildings um, fascinate the public, a lot of them. You know, they are, on the one hand. Um, I think probably what the questioner is really referring to are the buildings that can be perceived to be hostile by the average pedestrian walking by them or driving by them even. Um, and um, so, you know, I think that's also um, perhaps a, a slightly longer seminar it would be fun to be putting up a bunch of buildings on the screen and saying, you know, what is it, how can we analyze these? What is it about this modern building that um, is pleasing to the passerby or um, can be admired? And what is it about this other one that does not? Um, I know there's been a kind of there is a current fashion to make buildings black, mm. very dark. Um, and in fact, um, David Adje designed a very interesting public housing or affordable housing project somewhere in New York, maybe Brooklyn or the Bronx. Um, that was much admired, but it was black, you know, and nothing else around it was. And, you know, I just felt like that was 
calling attention to itself in a way that maybe was, um, I don't know. But in South Florida, for sure, you don't need black buildings because we should be building things that are light, that reflect light. Uh, you know, it's an energy sink otherwise. So um, it's an interesting question. What, it, what, what does the public like? Uh, you know, what appeals to them and what doesn't? And people do like kind of modern inventive things and mm -hmm. glass because it's clear and reflective and so on. And, um, you know, the occasional black building fitting into that might be appropriate as a kind of um, a punctuation point or some part of that variety. Um, uh, but I think how you manipulate form and color um, in relation to your context is probably what this question is about. You know, probably almost anything can be absorbed and accommodated in a good urban place, um, as long as you understand what else is going on around it and whether it's intended to be that kind of essential contrast um, or whether everybody's kind of juggling to have their building scene yeah. in a way that becomes um, aggressive. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. Um, just a few things before we wrap up. If you haven't already, head over to any of our streaming platforms to listen to the episode right before this one, episode 49, where we shared some exciting things that happened to us throughout the year and a few plans that we have for next year. And remember, we have the Layers of Design podcast shop where we um, sell sketchbooks and graphics of, of graphics created pretty much inspired by our Sketch It Out episodes. And the one for this episode will be up this week. So you can definitely get your sketchbook or your mug. And with that, I would like to say a big thank you again to our guest, Elizabeth, for being with us today and to our sponsor, Morfolio, and to all of you for joining and supporting us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Well, thank you for um, this opportunity. It was fun to be speaking with you. Your questions were great, as well as the ones that came in from the others. Um, it was fun, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you, bye.